I thank you. Well, yeah, so I am not Ronaldo Wilson, um, but I am delighted to be with you all today. And I'm more delighted to be able to facilitate a panel with three amazing colleagues. So if I can call up Dr. Fang, Dr. Cahigas, and Dr. Gamada, that would be wonderful. Uh, we have three um, neuropsychologists who are gonna be dialoguing with me around how we communicate effectively uh, with diverse communities around brain health and early detection. And we've learned so much and have had such insightful perspectives during the conference today. Um, but what we really need to be thinking about is how to bridge this to our communities of color. And hopefully we will gain a lot of insights and some concrete tips and tricks and effective communication strategies. So. I think our panelists come up. So as I said, we've um, had so many rich and insightful presentations and panels today on early detection. And what I'd like to do is um, learn from the three of you, because we have three wonderful experts, on how we take these learnings to our diverse communities. I know this is something at Alzheimer's Los Angeles. It's part of our mission is to work with lower income communities with communities of color. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and so I want to start off by asking, why are conversations around brain health and early detection so important, particularly with communities of color? Would anyone like to start? I'll, Dr. Gamada? I'll start us off. Um, I think it'll be a rich conversation for all of us. Um, um, in talking about you know early detection and health um, and why the importance in diverse communities. I think we heard from an amazing panel earlier and just the barriers that everyone navigates, right? And when we talk about diverse communities, it's all of us, we're all diverse. Um, and there are, um, the work of diversity is, is more challenging and more difficult than we give it credit for uh, most of the time. And um, we, we have to reorient the conversation to um, uh, what, you know, what, what, what is the importance of diversity and why diversity, right? And, and moving that beyond the moral um, argument of it's the right thing to do, but rather that it's the real scientific rigor. If you include everyone, what you find is the truth. If you don't include everyone, what you find is bias. Um, and clinically, that you are serving everyone in the population. Um, and so I think um, the focus, I think, for our panel in focusing on communities that have disadvantages and so forth is, is really important because um, we live in a system, we live in a society, and what puts folks at risk are those societal disadvantages. And um, we can also call those traumas, right? As, as clinicians, we call those traumas. And um, as we focus on the concentration of who has more of those social disadvantages, um, they're concentrated differently in different populations. So while we all have traumas, right, as humans in, on planet Earth, um, we, the, the concentration of that trauma is different in different demographic groups. And so um, our attention to who is at more risk for certain disease populations and so forth um, centers that um, in, in when, we, when we're talking about um, uh, the, the general population. But thank I'm just for, tagging in. <laughs> thank you for laying that foundation, giving us some context to propel the conversation forward. Dr. Cahigas? I would add that, you know, the onus really is on us as providers. Um, you know, I, I, I'm from UCLA. I apologize for not, uh, <laughs> for not being accessible. But accessibility, I think, is, is a huge piece of this. And the onus is on us. You know, people always expect, uh, I, I work predominantly with the Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, population in Espanol, bilingual, yes? So muchas gracias, thank you for having us here. Um, <clears throat> representation matters, and so having uh, doctors that speak the language, that know the culture, 
that uh, have had similar life struggles um, in, in extended families, uh, L Latina families, you know, uh, we all know someone that has something, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's probably the same in every family. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I think the onus being on us to create models of care that are accessible, that not just accessible, but that are welcoming. You know, we, we have a center and a clinic where <clears throat> we, we do evaluations in, in Espanol and, and, and for bilinguals, Latinos in English or, or in Spanish. And if you build it, they will come. Yes, if, 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 you, if you extend yourself and you put the onus on yourself as a scientist, as an educator, as an advocate, as a clinician, I think that's, that's a huge piece because there are so many systems, as Dr. Camaro was alluding to, that are working against people. And so we have to meet that uh, with an intentional stance um, that, that we are, 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 are being anti-racist, we, we, are, we are addressing the issues that we already know are there. Um, and that's for every provider, for every organization. It can't just be at the individual level, it has to be at a more organizational, systemic level as well. I think what you both <laughs> said is so beautiful and uh, very similar to what I was, have been thinking and I've wanted to say as well, and so thank you for saying that. Um, you know, thinking about different cultural populations, you know, even if you say like an Asian population, what is that, right? It's like, 50 different subpopulations, 100 plus languages. I mean, there's no way to really categorize it. Some kind of convenience, but who's convenience, right? So um, I think, you know, what is it at the core is how do we think about people and patients as people? Um, and, and how do we think of ourselves providers in that same way too? And we have our own biases and how can we check that um, instead of just like, what can we do for them? What can we do for us so that we can really connect? Uh, and so there's a humanizing quality to this that is super important. Um, understanding that we're in a system that is also medicalized. And so how do we balance that is, is I think a tricky piece. So I wanna ask you specifically about brain health and early detection. What is unique in different communities? Is that better? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, so my question is, when we talk about specifically brain health, and I'm curious to know from all of you, do you think that conversations around brain health are an entry point to talk about early detection, especially in diverse communities? So I guess that's one question that I have. And then my other question is, what is particularly unique in diverse communities when it comes to early detection? I can <clears throat> start us off. Please. I think that if you tie brain health to people's everyday lives, right? In, 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 in our Latinx community, if you tell folks your brain health is gonna affect the overall health and well-being of your familia, and that's the way in, you know, whether it's abuelita, abuelito, on, 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 on the spectrum that we're talking about here. <clears throat> but Alzheimer's and dementia affects us all. And so if we show the relevance and the connection, I think the rest comes naturally. <laughs> people will be invested and people will want to, 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 to know more. Um, as I said before, the onus is on us to make this dialogue, this discourse accessible and to connect it to people's everyday experience. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of Latina families um, are caring for someone that, that, that may have uh, early stage uh, Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, et cetera, and kids at the same time, right? That sort of sandwich effect is, is, is very normative in, in, in the population that I serve. And so I think breaking the ice and starting the conversation and just making sure that there is a, a sense of the relevance, once that connection is made, people will not leave you. They won't, they'll want, well, what can I do? What can we eat? What do we have to do? What, you know, it, it will all change. It'll open up. It'll open up. What a powerful community asset, right? Being part of the family unit and right, being able to leverage that <laughs> as an asset, because we talk a lot when we talk about communities of color and Alzheimer's, we talk about a lot of barriers, but it's nice to be thinking about some of the assets that our different communities have and how we can harness those. If, if we empower I would say Latinas. Latinas, they're the ones that do all the work. 
Yes, they, 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 I, I'm the first one to say, and, and mucho respeto, much respect, um, like promotoras in, in, the, in the health system here in the county. You know, if we help to empower people with in, information that is going to help their communities, then we all get to partner together. And, 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 and I think we, we start making a dent. Let's say also just understanding family, family mm -hmm. dynamics in general. So this is like for all people, we exist in a community and communities are like in your family and <clears throat> in you know who, local community and, and all of that. So thinking about that piece when you're talking to somebody who may not have the same experience as you, you can at least come from a stance of like, okay, um, tell me, tell me what your experience is with dementia in the family, just as like an example. I mean, this is not speaking exactly to, to your question, but this idea of like um, op opening up a conversation that is relevant to that person, like you were saying, and that, that in itself kind of brings you down um, to understand what that person values, uh, and then you can kind of adapt to your conversation from there. I just want to add on that that, that resiliency is um, something that was cultivated, right, as adaptive because it was um, survival for communities that were at more risk, had more traumas, had a lot more to overcome. And so tapping into community was a part of the survival tactic, mm -hmm. right? And so what we see now as, as you know, um, uh, oh, they have this unique benefit to them. It was a survival tactic, and it's something that we can capitalize on because when you think of who's most vulnerable for any disease, right, um, the person most vulnerable is the person that has no community, right? And so the more that we can build that in, in building with existing community partners, um, linking arms to, to what exists so that we connect the dots for folks, um, the family first and foremost, but also beyond that, what other community systems are there uh, that can also uh, participate in the care? There's a saying in Spanish, <clears throat> un dicho, yes, that, that says, las penas compartidas son menos. Mm -hmm. When we share our trials and tribulations, mm -hmm. they are lighter, they are less. And so that, as, as Dr. Guevara was saying, mm -hmm. is, is ingrained in, in a lot of our cultures, the sharing. Um, and, and it's when we become isolated and separated that we lose access to that resilience point, mm -hmm. to, to that adaptive survival, you know, las ganas, as we would say in Spanish. So let me ask you then, because we have this resiliency in communities, and as you said, we can garner that and propel that forward, but we also hear a lot about the stigma and shame around Alzheimer's dementia in various communities of color. And I wonder if you can speak a bit about what is that stigma? What is that shame? Where does it come from? Why is it there? And for providers, how do we have these conversations in the clinic when we know that there is stigma and shame as well? <laughs> it's Dr. Fang? Yeah, it's sort of a, a, a tricky one. Um, you know, of course there is stigma. In mental health stigma, like, and, and with Alzheimer's and dementia, the stigma is, is really difficult because um, being labeled in general is, is so hard, especially when there's no cure and we're, you know, like, uh, we're listening um, to the primary care uh, assessment and how great it is to have these questions and also knowing that so many people don't answer yes for years and years and years, even though they may know, um, but why aren't they answering yes? Uh, it may be a knowledge thing, not, not aware. It also may be like, well, what are you going to do with this information? Um, where is this going to go? Are you going to tell my partner, this person, that I wrote all of this stuff about, about them, right? So um, there's a nuance in it, especially when you're talking about communi uh, communities that is not um, just stigma, but really like 
the interconnected nature of when you deliver information, what's going to happen to that information, I think is really important to keep in mind. So I'll, maybe I'll yeah. start it off from that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the stigma is for everyone, right? And then in certain populations, there is uh, just what uh, Dr. Bang was saying, um, where is this information going? Because with health disparities, we have to come back to the foundation of health disparities is you know, medical abuse as well, right? So um, where is this going? Where is this tying into? Because these all link, right? And, and for us, our work is to tap into what the history is because the history comes into the room. Uh, the history, uh, we can't do diversity work without bringing in the arc of the history of um, what, what has happened, right? It's, it's like doing a medical workup without doing a good thorough interview. So our, our work in really building that trust and, and that falls on us and not on our patients um, to really um, share the details of why you ask what you ask and not just asking the questions. I think we have to get better at asking good questions as well. Um, but it, it's beyond the questions that we ask, it is um, uh, also laying the foundation of the why behind our questions um, so that the family, the patients, everyone in the space that we create feels safe and brave to share the truth of what they're navigating in, in their home day to day. Um, you know, the, unfortunately, there is medical brutality that the communities face, right? And so just knowing that, and when, you, when they walk into the room that you want to set a foundation of like, I know this history, and I want to create a space for you um, that is centered in your belonging, in your care. Um, and, and cultivating that is artwork. It is creative work. It's beyond the, the checklist. It's beyond the efficiency that the system forces, right? And so it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's some of the most creative work that we do is cultivating that belonging, um, that safety and that authenticity in your in the care that we we give to our patients. Yeah. Well said. I think, um, yeah, very well said. <laughs> <laughs> the the construct of stigma is one that really fascinates me, because when we think of stigma, most people think of it as residing within an individual or within a community. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is something that exists within a minoritized community. And even the term minoritized shows you it's from the outside going in. So I think it's less about stigma inside the person and more about how we stigmatize. Right? And so we have to be the ones to, the onus is on us <clears throat> to meet people where they are and to create that safe, brave space where people can speak up. Um, and feel comfortable and normalize the, 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 the dialogue and the conversation that needs to happen. Because otherwise, when we talk about stigma in, in communities of color or minoritized communities, we're, we're blaming them. I mean, we're creating a, a, an us and a them. We're othering. Um, and it's, 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 it doesn't reside within. It's something that is done. It is stigmatizing. So we have to be anti-stigmatizing. Yes. One thing, <clears throat> I'll give just a very brief example. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, common symptom, anosognosia, right? The person doesn't know what's the, 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 that they're losing the, the, the memory um, or, or that they're developing certain symptoms. So how do you talk about that in the presence of a patient? With our Latino patients, <clears throat> I, I use la araña. Yes, a, an araña is a spider. And I say, imagine that I have a spider on my back. Um, and you say, doctor, you've got a spider on your back. And I turn and I say, where? You know, where? Oh, it's crawling up your neck. Where? I can't see it. Right? Um, I say to people, there will be some things that you yourself won't be able to see. But there will be some things that we cannot see unless you talk about them, unless you bring them out. And so let's just accept that there may be differences of opinion and you may say, see different things. Your, your loved ones may see things that you don't see, like that spider on the back of my neck. But there may also be things inside of you that we won't really learn about unless you open up and talk about it. And so the power, I think what I'm trying to say is the power of metaphor and storytelling, the cuento and, and, and dicho in Spanish, 
is incredibly powerful in breaking down stigmatizing encounters clinically. I love that example. I'll just piggyback off it. I, I feel like using this and knowing your, knowing your patients well enough to know <clears throat> What bit, uh, what bit is going to resonate with mm -hmm. them. Um, that is a real skill, but I think you know, we all have that skill, and so it, it doesn't take hours and hours. Sometimes when you know that person, and of course there's a consistency there, they come back, it's those like two things you go back to, and, um, and it allows, it gives people permission to be able to share something um, and allows that care partner also to potentially mm -hmm. say something to say, well, your partner, you know, may say things or may be able to, but that's, it's all in the best interest of, mm -hmm. of sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that sounds, sounds like part of what we're talking about is that relationship building, right? And being able to connect with people, understand them and give them that space to do so. How do you reconcile that as providers with your, you know, the cognitive health assessment should take you about five minutes to complete. Um, doesn't seem like a lot of time and a lot of space to encourage those opportunities for bravery and, and discourse and dialogue. So how do you balance that? I think that there are certain um, clinical heuristics <laughs> that you can, you can use. You know, I, I, I hold my patient's hand. I hold their hand because I want them to lead me towards certain things, and I want to be able to lead them towards certain things, and I want to establish that connection. As a Latino, I, I was raised in, they, pinching my cheeks and touching, yeah, abrazos, very demonstrative, <laughs> right, within the culture. And there's variability in every culture with regard to that, but what I'm getting at is sometimes it's just, it's that little uh, cultural door or know-how of knowing how to open it. You know, I, I use dichos uh, uh, all of the time, sayings. You know, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There's no uh, bad that doesn't come about for a greater good. We're going to get through this together. Okay. That little touchstone with the culture will put a person at ease. I use humor. Right? I talk about la, la sejuela. La sejuela. And people say, sejuela? Like, like sequela? No, sejuela. Sejuela juventud. That, that youth, youth left us, right? That's what we're here to talk about, right? These are the things that come, you know, and oh, people laugh, and, and, and you build a rapport. Basic clinical skills. Building rapport and a sense of we are shoulder to shoulder, facing this together. Um, I am with you. You are not alone. These are all things that every patient wants to hear. Um, but we don't do enough of that because we feel uncomfortable. That's why the onus is on us. These are difficult conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I will say, as a neuropsychologist, we're very privileged in the amount of time that we can have with patients. So it, it's a very different world in that sense. Um, and we even have conversations before they come to see us. So there's a little bit of a, you have this appointment. I just want to orient you on what this appointment is going to take. And so a lot of the things that were coming up that Greg was sharing um, uh, and um, that Sandy was sharing, the Dave was sharing, of just like the disorienting piece of like walking in and, and being just asked all these questions not, and then having all these uh, follow-ups and so forth. Um, we don't have that, but that's a, as a specialty in neuropsychology, right? Um, and so for those that do have that limited amount of time, some things that I, I've heard have been beneficial and helpful is um, the person that the point of contact before, whether that's the administrator, um, admin staff, and so forth, that that person gives a little bit more of an orientation of what that work update might look like. And so that's just at the level of orientation, right? So I think we're always nervous going into any appointment, doctor or not, any appointment is, is like what's going to happen. So just at the orientation piece, having someone orient you ahead of time, the day, day before the appointment, just helps alleviate some of the anxiety about the, the process and, and what all is gonna happen. Should I fast? I, like we do brain health work, but we have patients that think they're gonna have blood work done. Mm -hmm. So I didn't eat or take my medication. I'm like, whoa, 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 let's do that <laughs> before we eat. start anything. <laughs> uh, because they're, that's what they're used to when they go to doctor's appointments. I love that. Um, thank you for, uh, for sharing that. So I'm a geropsychologist, so I've done some neuropsych work, but really I speak to 
um, clients in, in therapy. And so in the same way, usually I have a bit more time. Um, and so I, it, it speaks to this idea of like, every provider in that person's journey has a place. Um, and so what is the responsibility or what is, what can you do in your one connection with that, that person? And as a Jero psychologist, primary care is huge. I mean, like I don't get people that usually self-refer, right? So it's having that really great communication with PCPs and, um, and so just like that initial rapport building, because a lot of people, when they have that great relationship, they trust their PCP so much. And they keep coming back, and they'll ask like random questions here and there. But there's to have a trusted person um, to be able to say, hey, go to this person, and then tell me how it went. Um, or uh, that person's going to connect with me. I mean, this is a whole interoperability thing that is uh, another conversation. But um, there's, there's a time and place for these different pieces. So, even practically, you know, without that time, there are also times where um, patients are sitting in the waiting room. And so, uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting in the waiting room, there's things on the wall that I'm looking at. And, um, you know, I'm like forced to read it because I don't have anything else to do. So, is there something you can put on there that maybe they won't ask you that first time, but the next time they come in, they may say, oh, like, it's something to like bounce off of or to use to have that com start that conversation. So what are your tips? What are your tricks, especially for providers that may not be from the same community? Maybe they don't speak a particular language, um, so they don't have the ability to use the common stories or los dichos, you know, that as much as they may try, um, you know, I think I studied in Mexico, I speak Spanish, but that level of like the, what you're talking about, the storytelling, um, los no, I'm not sure that I could do that, <laughs> right? That's okay. And I'd imagine for some of our providers, like we are who we are and we can try to learn about other cultures and ethnic groups and languages, but the reality is there's certain differences that we all have. I think it speaks to the, the, the parallel journey of helping the providers that we already have and being committed to create a more diverse provider workforce. I really think that we need to think systemically rather than individually because we end by, by saying, well, what can we do for the providers? We privilege the providers. What patients need, I think, and families is doctors that look like them, that speak their language, that are members of the culture, especially in a place like Los Angeles, <clears throat> you know, the, the, between uh, Asian, broadly defined, like Latino, broadly defined, right, African-American, 75% of Los Angeles, it's only 26% or so that is non-Hispanic white. And yet look at the doctors, right? So, so yes, it's important to give tips and, and, and everything to individual providers that we have now, but I think equally important, if not more so, is that we really commit to, to, to advocating for a more diverse workforce. And it can be uh, interdisciplinary. You know, I'm thinking, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll plug on the UCLA side when I saw the, the couple up here, I said, oh God, I wish they would have been part of our Alzheimer's and dementia care program. Because when someone gets a diagnosis, they become eligible for this program and all of a sudden there's a multidisciplinary team that addresses every little facet and thing that they need from caregivers to estate legal planning to a whole, a whole host of things. I think we need to think about systems and pathways um, because there's too much of an onus on individual clinicians. We need to create community among providers so that they have, like you said, I think a go-to person that they can rely on that will be able to help the person in, in, in the next step of the journey. Absolutely. Um, I think I'll just add on that, um, you know, if you, as a provider of someone that is not oriented to a person's culture, the first and foremost thing you do is listen. Like, that we need to listen well. Um, I think, I think, um, was that Greg or Dave? One of them said, literally said that. that uh, no, Greg said it. Greg, sorry, Dave, Dave said it. And he said, um, if I can remember verbatim, he said, um, 
one thing I wish that they would have done is I wish they would have slowed down and listened. Just slow it down and listen and process, right? Again, it's the time piece, and that's why we always come back to that this is a systemic issue, right? Mm -hmm. That we have a 15 minute visit and it's like in and out. But the biggest part, if, if you're talking for 15 minutes and got nothing, your patient didn't feel heard, didn't feel understood, we, the, the, that 15 minute was completely wasted, right? And so if it's that you spent 12 minutes listening and you got three minutes to sum it all up and, 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 and um, wrap up the clinical visit, at least some, you heard something, you can follow up on certain points at the next visit, um, but that there was some takeaway rather than this um, rushed but no, um, no result piece. So it's like walking into systems of check boxes doesn't allow for any relationship building. And so um, if we can allocate more of that time to the relationship building, um, w we can get to the check boxes because then you can actually do all the check box thingies outside of the clinic, outside yeah. of the 15 time minutes. Place. Yeah. 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 And have it be meaningful. <laughs> right, right. And did I hear you correctly? That's one thing I always, um, you know, language is really, really important to me in your clinical care. So um, I'm just going to rephrase what I think I heard you say. Does that land correct for you, or did I get that completely wrong? Um, and of course, creating that safe and brave space is, I, I want them to feel brave enough to say, no, no, actually, doc, you got that wrong. <laughs> That's not what I said. Um, but like, if you don't do that bounce back, um, you, you can have them completely wrong in the chart because of a cultural misunderstanding um, at the foundation of the visit. Yeah, I would just add one, one thing to it, which is uh, do, doing our own work on mm -hmm. ourselves uh, because there's, there's the patient and we focus so much on the patient, but it, it's again a relationship and we impose on to, into the space as well. And often we don't recognize how it comes off if we're not really spending the time to think about it. And, um, and there's so much complexity to us as a human, you know, um, and, and for, you know, my mo minority population, like, so we were talking about like immigrants, and so it's like, well, that immigrant, the generation that came as an Im immigrated here, and, and the first generation, that dynamic is very different. And so, you know, thinking about the care partner, the person that comes in, is it the adult child who's the first gen, or are you speaking to a, fourth generation Japanese American woman who's like, it's, it's, so, it's so different. And so, you know, it's very complex and it's hard to get in a small amount of time. But if you, if you work on our, yourself, if we work on ourselves, it makes things a bit clearer and kind of opens up conversation. Yeah. I think that's so um, important. The, the, the looking at yourself and making a commitment to say, I'm going to learn something about the population that I'm serving. Right? If you're in Los Angeles <laughs> and, and you don't know very much about Mexican culture specifically, um, I would say you're probably somewhat negligent as a provider mm -hmm. just by the numbers. Right? So if we all commit to being, I say, <clears throat> Jack or Jill of all trades and master of one, <laughs> you know, increasing our cultural, through cultural humility, trying to increase a little bit more know-how, a little bit more understanding, that'll go a really long way. Um, but it requires effort, it requires care, and, and it requires that humanistic uh, seeing the person, the people that, that, that come to you as, as human beings. So I'm, look, I'm looking at the time, I don't want to dominate too much, but I have a question for you specifically, Dr. Fang. Uh, <coughs> you've been involved for a very long time in Alzheimer's Los Angeles's API Dementia Care Network. Oh, I have 10 minutes. I'm not as pressed for time as I thought. I have more time with you than we have to do some of our clinical assessments. <laughs> <laughs> the irony of things. So I wanted to... So the allocation of time and resources. Right? Right? <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you could speak for a minute or two about the Dementia Care Network and the role that it plays within the API community here in Los Angeles and 
how it kind of bridges some of the things we're talking about in this conversation. Yeah, so one of the things that, so I, I'm a member of the, the um, API Dementia Care Network, and what I love about it is that um, every other month, you, you, I allocate the time to spend with these other lovely people who are, um, who are involved in dementia care in some way, but maybe not necessarily a clinician or whatever. And um, just getting together, uh, you learn so much. Just like people are talking about something else, like what was your favorite movie or something like that? And what was the favorite book? And just allowing for space, um, I've learned a lot, of, uh, a lot about like the resources, even things like clinical trials, um, uh, all this information that um, I would have to seek out and everybody's really busy and so it's just like, okay, well let me just like allocate this time so I know I'm gonna learn a lot of good stuff. Um, and that then translates to my clients or to people I'm talking to or when I go to skilled nursing facilities and I'm just like, you know, there's a lot of word of mouth and, and this is its own kind of community in some ways. And so it transfers that way uh, in addition to like actual like clinical resources that I'm referring somebody to. So I'll speak, that's sort of something that I really have benefited from, which is a personal thing as well. You get to build really good relationships and from there you know who uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the right person for this, but this person can tell me who I can go to. And, you know, should there be better ways to do that <laughs> instead of going to, yeah, maybe, but that's a, a whole nother system, system question. So um, that's one of the things I've really benefited from. Yeah. Thank you. And you touched on resources, and I'm curious to know, within your experiences, um, what resources are available to encourage meaningful and effective conversations and kind of break down some of these barriers with community. Do you have any resources for our providers or for our families um, that you have found particularly beneficial? For providers, I'm a fan of pointing towards to pointing people to Ethnomed, um, which is a website <clears throat> that gives brief histories of, of, of different uh, cultural groups throughout the world. Um, you know, our, our own ignorance as providers, I think, is a, is a scary thing. Um, when we're trying to meet people that they're most vulnerable and render evidence-based, like, care that actually helps and doesn't harm. Um, that's, that's a simple one, just, just, to, just to, get to get to begin to know. Uh, uh, at least, for example, if you have a patient from El Salvador, you need to know about uh, the violence in El Salvador during certain generations that were exposed and others that weren't exposed as much. Um, if you don't know that going in to, a, to, a, to an assessment where someone has memory problems, that's, you know, PTSD, flashback, all, all that stuff, you know, very, very important. Um, so I think resources that way, there's a cultural navigator, I think also an app that, that, that is similar to Ethnomed that is, that, that is a, a, a good starting point for providers. I, 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 I'm always a little bit reticent because I don't want people to think, oh, if I use that, then I'm, I'm good to go. <clears throat> but that's, that's, that's a good starting point. Absolutely. Um, resources just generally. Um, so I'm part of the Dementia Care Network with Preacher Niles as well with Alzheimer's LA. And um, just the, the resources that exist within communities, very small nonprofits that really do the boots on the ground work that um, a lot of the, the bigger, larger organizations don't really tap into that work um, of just like the very basic needs. Like I had a, a caregiver recently who um, had had hip surgery and needed a commode and insurance was giving her all types of hell and calls me and I need a commode. Do you know anyone who's got a commode? I'm like, Actually, I do. <laughs> and I was able to call one of the community providers like, hey, last time I was there, I, I did see a room full of commodes. You still got some? Um, and like, we were able to get that to her within 24 hours. Uh, but that's, that's like the work of that, um, knowing where the community is, knowing where the resources are, and that these are things that were cultivated, right? Boots on the ground. These were all donations, um, people that had had use for it at one point that didn't need it no more, that donated it to a particular 
um, organization. Um, and so just linking to um, what exists at the community level, because I think uh, the larger um, foundations, organizations do really, really good work um, at, the, at the research and, and policy level, but we, we need more hands-on, tangible things that caregivers are always in need for. Um, and those exist in very small, tiny nonprofits and organizations. And we need more of a link and a bridge between the larger organizations mm -hmm. and those tiny, you know, mom and pops kind of spaces where they, 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 they saw a need and just said, you know what, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm based off of the experience I had, I am building this. Um, and that's where most of them started off and they really meet the needs <coughs> of the community in ways that um, others have not tapped into um, and, and that the resources haven't gone into. So um, I've been really lucky to have found those systems through uh, Petra Niles of Alzheimer's LA who, who's really, you know, she's been doing this work for years um, and, has, <laughs> and has really, um, the, the network that, that she's cultivated um, in, 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 the, in the community of, oh, you know what, you need to call this person for this issue, you need to call this person for, like, that, that's like a resource you can't put a price tag on. Absolutely. It's like we can't all be everything. Right. So how can we know the people and the systems for the right time and place for that person? Because we all know about data dump and information overload, and there's so much out there. I mean, it's not a, a lack of information in a lot of ways, right? But it's how can we get that information right to that person, give them what to expect here so that there's, there's hope and there's productivity and make sense um, and move them along. And when you're talking about you know, the community resources and who has this and that, there's like a really positive benefit to those conversations, even the, the belongingness, the feeling that you're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not just the resource, it's not just the commode, it's the connection with those people as you're building, as you're going through all of this. We talked about <clears throat> empowering people earlier, right? Um, caregiver support groups, I think it was mentioned up here. That's, that's, where, that's where I started. It's, it's ironic, Dr. Alving was a neurologist when I was a, a research assistant before even graduate school in Fresno with UCSF. And um, it was there that I learned in caregiver support groups how to live with Alzheimer's disease and how to thrive. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting at, at a caregiver group and people sit, talking about the gift of Alzheimer's disease. And I was like, what? <laughs> the gift? Um, I think <clears throat> caregiver groups are, are a missed resource, especially when people leave the groups. Right? Because they amass all this information, uh, all these connections, all this support and everything. As long as they're within the group, they're able to share it. But then their loved one moves on, right? And they leave the group. And all of that amassed life experience and knowledge doesn't go anywhere. We should have programs that invest in caregivers. Caregivers that have, I mean, there used to be, uh, I think there's still the California Caregiver Research, Resource Centers, right? But they're not as funded as they used to be. Um, if we invest in caregivers, that that's the way, because they've lived it. Because they, 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 they've, they've dealt with the, the crappy doctors, and they, you know, with everything. Um, and yet we don't see them as a resource and we don't invest in them, which would edify, you know, it would bring, bring meaning to the experience. I've gone through this, let me share, let's, let's invest in our caregivers. Um, I think that's, that's a missed resource and one that, that could really make a difference. It also helps to normalize being a caregiver in a lot of ways, because we all, I mean, what's the person, I mean, we're all like dealing with this unexpected career, right? Uh, and so <coughs> it's not talked about until like, now you're labeled as the caregiver and you're like, wait, but I'm the same person and I've been doing this for years already. So, you know, it's, it's part of life and part of what happens when you're, you love other people and you're connected and you wanna care for people. And, um, and yeah, it makes just a lot of sense to connect with others who are having the same experience. That human experience, as we keep talking about. So 
As we close, um, I don't know if there are any questions from anyone here. We don't have a ton of time, but we certainly have enough time for two people, assuming you don't talk too long. <laughs> Both people in the audience and our panelists. <laughs> Thank you for, where do I put this? Okay, thank you for letting me ask a question. Um, one thing that was occurring to me as you were talking about um, really understanding your, you know, your patient's background. I'm really fortunate to actually work with a neuropsychologist who always gives the historical context mm. for our patients. It's, compl it's totally amazing and really helps. Um, but um, I think when, especially when you're not from the same background as the patient and you're trying to do a dementia assessment, and I feel like there's a lot of burden on neuropsychology very specifically, um, and we're, we're trying to reduce the stigmatizing way we're doing it and the way we're um, I, I actually think sometimes we actually, it is a threatening, just inherently threatening assessment and that people are very aware that it actually is going to take away independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's actually going to take away independence and freedom. And there are folks who have been in situations, they've been in situations where that's, um, that's happened to them repeatedly. And so when I have patients who don't want to, I don't know what to do here. I'm so sorry. Um, when they don't want the um, assessment, I actually see that a good sign. Like they're being self-protective. They're, they're, you know, advocating for themselves. It makes it really hard to take care of them sometimes or move things forward. But often I do see it being used in a, frankly, at the end of the day, a way to formally remove some of their independence and, and power. And I know we don't want to use it that way. Um, and that a lot of times we're not using it that way, but I'm wondering if you have either a language or an approach to help contextualize, especially for people who've been repeatedly abused by the system, how this can help them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That comes up a lot. Um, neuropsychology at its foundation has a lot of um, uh, medical bias and, and racism sort of built, baked into the, the, the tools that we use and like we've written about it of just the, some of the stimuli that we use in, in neuropsychology as well. Um, and so really um, when, when the patient comes into space to really say we're, we're gathering data, um, we have some tools, our tools are not going to be definitive. We're going to work together to really get a clear picture um, and to really um, tag in as we're a team and we're going to build this together and we're going to see how we can optimize your care. Um, and, and that, you know, first you're like sharing power in the room, right? Like you're the expert of you. You're the lived life and all of that. I have some tools here. They're not the best. We're going to use the best ones from the tools that we have here. Um, and, and, and I find that when we set it that way, um, it helps. And when there's a dynamic where the patient um, doesn't have the awareness, but the family is really concerned about their safety and so forth, um, I just say, you know what? You, you, you don't think there's anything wrong. Uh, your, your daughter seems to have this concern. We're going to work together. We're just, it's nobody's right or wrong, but we're going to work together to, to see how we can optimize your health going forward. Um, make, taking away that dichotomy really helps in um, alleviating the, the tension in the room and, and, and really trying to like, get them to come in for the assessment. I, I like to tell people that <clears throat> a neuropsych assessment, the tests themselves are like all the other tests that you get. We're looking for points of convergence, yeah? With the EMRI, with the PET scan, with the blood work, with the neuropsych testing tools, right? But, but the neuropsychologist, the human person, working with them and integrating that information and making sense out of it with them, that's the report. That, that I think, is what helps to, to lessen the, the anxiety, the fear, uh, the triggering from, 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 from prior experiences, all of that. When we meet people, as human beings, because our tests are only part of what we do. As neuropsychologists, it's the integration of information, the brain behavior relationships and the inferences that we draw, that's, that's our, 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 our bread and butter, <laughs> if you will. So I think just helping people to understand what our role is, um, that we're not gatekeepers, but that we're, 
we're, we're, we're looking for information and to synthesize that with them. Even having a short conversation with the neuropsychologist you're working with um, mm -hmm. can give you that information, and so that information can be repeated, and so there, there's a feeling of connection and like, okay, I can expect this, I went here, oh, that's what happened, and then you learn from that. So just those short conversations with other um, providers I think helps a lot. Okay, if I can have you join me in thanking our panelists for such a rich conversation.